Hello BookTube. As I've mentioned on a few videos now, Boston is headed into a genuine heat wave. Uh, 90 degrees Fahrenheit tomorrow, 100 degrees on Thursday, 95 on Friday, 95 on Saturday. And with a massive heat and humidity like that, it's probably going to take a few days to wash it all out. So Sunday and Monday might not be any picnic either. It's going to be a long stretch of hot weather uh, here in Boston. And although I personally am going to love it <laughs> because I am always cold, I'm always hungry, and the music is always too loud. Uh, I'm still going to be cautious because my little dog is sensitive to the heat. She's going to want to charge around in the middle of the day and we're not going to be able to do that. And also I'm sensitive to myself, you know, just because I'm not cold doesn't mean my body can't overheat. It's going to be a bad idea for a couple of those days to run any kind of errands, to do anything strenuous. Uh, and so, to stock up for the heat wave, I went to the Brattle Bookshop. <laughs> It's a used bookstore in the heart of Boston. Uh, they've got a huge sale lot where the books are dirt cheap and there are thousands of them to pick from and they're changing all the time. And I went there this morning. Uh, and the flimsy excuse, the justification that I gave myself was that I wanted to stock up on, on books for the heat wave. Uh, you might be saying, well, didn't you stock up on books yesterday? And didn't you stock up on books a few times last week? Yeah. I said it was flimsy. <laughs> right? I went anyway and... It was an overcast morning. The sun has broken out. The, the overcast morning was the last bit of protection that we had. Now the sun has broken out and the heat is just going to keep... Now that the sun is here, the clouds probably aren't going to come back in any major way. So we're going to have just escalating heat from here on out for the rest of the week. Uh, but it was cool this morning and it was cloudy this morning. And it was a wonderful time. <laughs> it was a wonderful time. Uh, I, I had no interactions with the staff this time around. I had no interaction with the customers. And I was there by myself. I was just me and the books. And I got a pile of books. <laughs> I got a pile of them. I have actually forgotten what it's like to go to the Brattle Bookshop and get just a handful of books. I've got, I get a, seems like every time I go there, I get a pile of books. They're dirt cheap. That's what helps. So we're, I'm going to show them to you. <laughs> because a lot of you have said, have told me, either in comments or in emails. Keep in mind, you can email me at any time. Love getting your emails. I, you got to be a little bit understanding about how many email I get hundreds of emails a day I try to answer them all but if you make it difficult <laughs> if you send me a doctoral dissertation thousands and thousands of words that probably I'm probably not going to answer that or I'm going to give it an answer that's going to feel like an insult to you because it's just going to be a line or two better for you know quick friendly conversation the type of thing that email was built for uh, but one way or another uh, a lot of you have expressed that you really like my Brattle book hauls, not least of which because a lot of you live in places where there's nothing even like the Brattle. Where the closest that you come is the Amazon marketplace, where you're at the mercy of a liar who's listing something fraudulently. But to go to a gigantic, uh, a big used bookstore that refreshes its stock all the time, a lot of you don't have the opportunity to do that. I'm happy for you to shop vicariously through me. And especially since it, it is shopping vicariously because a lot of times I hold up a book from the Brattle and one of you will say, I'd really like that. If you wouldn't mind sending it to me, I'd, I'd really like that. Or if you want to look for, a, if you want to keep the copy that you showed, if you want to look for a copy from me, I'd really appreciate it. I'm also perfectly fine. I'm happy to do that. Uh, so we're going to start with mass market paperbacks. And we'll start off by going back to 1888 to Whitechapel, Ooh, the Knight of the Ripper, by no less than Robert Block, the author of Psycho. Uh, this is his Jack the Ripper novel. I read this thing when it came out uh, eons ago. This came out in the 1980s, I think. Yeah, 1984. This came out in 1984, and I read it then. I bought it at the bookstore, uh, Prairie Lights Bookstore in Iowa City, uh, and read it. It's 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 breath. Robert Block it writes uh, breathless bad prose and <laughs> you know there's no there's no sense in giving him a library of america volume but nevertheless enjoyable and night of the ripper is is very enjoyable i believe it was the book that was kind of the the kind of sort of inspiration for a television miniseries about jack the ripper starring michael Caine at his worst <laughs> at his worst screaming just screaming the whole time that I, you know, the, the, that classic idiom uh, may, spoken by an actor who was a friend of Kane's, who, but who was ten times the actor, who said, if you have to scream to convey intensity, you're failing at your art. 
Kane doesn't get the memo in that miniseries. I have no idea if it's been if it's been captured on videotape or DVD or whatever. But I remember watching it. Uh, and I just noticed that the stamping is off for this book. That's interesting. Unless that's intentional, but I don't remember my original copy in 1984 looking like that. Could be that just that the stamping is off there, and that that the that the outline of the letters should be exactly contiguous with the raised letters. One way or another, I haven't read this since 1984. Happy to read it again. Uh, then a uh, book. This is not my favorite cover of this book, but I'll definitely take it. This is *The King of Elfland's Daughter* by Lord Dunsany, uh, one of the greatest works of fantasy ever written. Uh, Elspreth de Camp on the cover there compares it to Tolkien, and that is absolutely correct. This it comes before *The Lord of the Rings*, but it is brilliant. Uh, this author, I think, is just generally brilliant. But *The King of Elfland's Daughter* is, in novel form, his masterpiece. Uh, and this is by the same cover artist who did the original paperbacks of uh, Evangeline Walton's Mabinogian Quartet uh, that uh, I love as well. Uh, again, a great fantasy series. Uh, but this is this is just high fantasy, and it is absolutely delightful. I saw it in a mass market paperback. You don't see mass market paperbacks much anymore, so I grabbed it. Uh, then these next two are science fiction. They are both by the same author, but not in the same register. First, we have an early novel of Gordon Dixon. This is Time Storm. A little bit of ratty shape, but it'll, it'll stand up to one more reread. I've read this a couple of times. Uh, this is a standalone science fiction novel about what would happen to Earth if time went crazy. And suddenly, past and future were intermingling or, inter or interchanging places or whatnot. And it's kind of it, it's enjoyable. I, I, I will definitely read it again. I'm sure I'll find new stuff in it. Uh, it has a couple of the ticks that this author brings to too much of his fiction. Uh, there's a, there's a, a sort of idealized projection of himself as a hyper-masculine main character in a lot of his fiction. A lot of his friends jokingly noticed that and wanted to chide him away from it. I think if he'd listened to them, he might have might have made uh, might have been a better author than he ended up being. Uh, one way or another, this is a standalone Gordon Dixon novel. He wrote 500 of them, uh, but he also wrote a series. He wrote a few series. We saw The Dragon and the George, for instance. That ended up being part of the series. But he wrote uh, other series, too. And the, mo the one he's best known for is the Dorsai books. They take place in a future concilium of worlds where one of those worlds, Dor the Dorsai, is a small, rocky planet that really has nothing in the way of exports to, to put itself on the market of the, the system economy, except for its sons and daughters. Who are superb physical specimens and trained to fairly well in all matters military. So the Dorsai become the soldiers and mercenaries of choice for all the other worlds in the system that can't match them in terms of military. And uh, Gordon Dixon wrote some early Dorsai stories. They caught on with fans. He wrote a couple of early Dorsai novels. Lost Dorsai, Spirit of Dorsai, Soldier Ask Not, a novel called Dorsai, Tactics of Mistake, that have really good parts in them and some of them are just great from beginning to end. Soldier Ask Not is great from beginning to end. Lost or Sai is great from beginning to end. Uh, all about exploring what that would be like if your, if your export was the blood and the bravery of your own people. What that would be like. And, and exploring also all the other worlds in that system. Uh, and that's, that series, the beginning of it was terrific, but Gordon Dixon, I could chart this author. I've watched his career and I, I could chart where it went wrong. He had a female graduate student, first of all, attach herself to his work and start telling him just the last thing that a histrionic person like himself needed to hear, which is that he was worth studying for the ages, that he was a literary figure with a capital L, and he started believing it. So the Dorsai books started becoming massively allegorical and introspective and long, <laughs> very long, and that heroic idealization of the main character started to get much worse and also much more misogynistic to, not not to to go all 21st century but you notice it when it's really bad then it's impossible to ignore in favor of a good story especially since those later dorsai novels didn't have a good story nevertheless it's been a while since i tried any of them and i saw one of them for free or for a dollar so i grabbed it the chantry glue guild with this classic 1990s cover this would have come out in the early 1990s right you can tell because all the books look uh, 1989. So, the, you you saw a lot of books with this cover artist. Don't know how they got this kind of work. This is on the uh, Gondolara novels by Randall Jarrett as well, and a bunch of others. 
Uh, and you can tell from the cover that the, the uh, this the Chantry Guild, the the Galactic Encyclopedia, the the others, the, the, the these novels start to become the struggles of one essential man who ponders deeply. The women, Gordon Dixon at this point in his career would have scoffed if you said, why don't you have a woman character to ponder deeply? The men struggle deeply, they ponder deeply, the women support them and whatnot. A total betrayal of the earlier stories in the Dorsai series, which featured really interesting female characters. But one way or another, I haven't read this since the end of the 80s. I haven't read it since I read it in this paperback back when I bought this in a bookstore. So it's entirely possible that I was maybe being un unfair. I will, I will definitely give it another try. They, I, one of you, I think, sent me uh, electronic copies of the entire, he called it the child cycle. I, is it even on here? Uh, it's the return, the triumphant return of the door. Oh yeah, child cycle right there. Uh, after, after Byron. Oh my God. <laughs> anyway, uh, I, one of you sent me e-copies, I think of the whole of, of the door side books. So I have them anyway, but I not the mass market. I saw this mass market paperback, and this is exactly the format that I had it in and read it in, uh, and threw it across the room in originally. So I, I couldn't resist for a dollar. Most of these were a dollar, so I couldn't resist. Uh, this next one is a trade paperback with a classic uh, original '90s cover, and I couldn't pass it up, especially since it's an example of booktube peer pressure. From certain quarters, the guilty parties will know who they are. Who talked reminded me how much I love this author and reminded me of how little I have in book form. And I have a few things in ebook form, but I don't think I have this one. This is The War of the End of the World by Mario Vargas Llosa. With this great, that great, again, a very recognizable cover artist. I bet the cover artist is not credited any more than the one. Uh, this is translated by Helen Lane. This, who is the cover artist here? I bet it, they don't credit. Uh, no, they don't. And do they credit this, the, the 90s hairdo, uh, Chantry Guild, do they credit this off artist? Hey, baby. How you doing? <laughs> How you doing? Oh, you're, you're a good girl. Uh, no, they don't. Okay, so uh, one way or another, you've seen, I'm sure you've seen, if you've been in used bookstores, you've probably seen covers that look like this. It's just got all that detail. And this is a, a big, terrific book. I love, this author wrote a book in, in English, it's called Aunt Julia and the Scriptwriter, and it's my favorite, Mario Vargas Llosa. Uh, but this, I think, is the greatest book he ever wrote. Even so, I hate to say it, because I, I love that other book, but this, I remember being just unbelievable about a weird kind of anti-perfect, anti-perfection commune uh, that manages to do the one thing that any res presiding government can't have a weird commune do, which is succeed. Uh, so the, the government crushes it. And this is the, a big, expansive story. But the thing I remember most about it uh, is that uh, Vargas Llosa here is at the top of his literary form. It's not just the idea and the plot and the characters, it's the literary, it's the writing. The writing is just so beautiful here. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look for, I'll reinforce this trade paperback and look forward to rereading it. Uh, then this next one, uh, this next one was a gamble. The nice thing, one of the nice things about the Brattle sale lot is that the prices are so low you can gamble. Uh, you can find something that strikes your fancy and just get it. Uh, and I did, <laughs> I got this. This is the kind of book that tends to interest me. We'll just see if this is an example of what does. But this is something that I have never read called Code, uh, with the subtitle being The Hidden Language of Computer Hardware and Software. It's by Charles Petzold, who uh, did a lot to develop Windows software. Did a lot, he was there from the beginning and has written more than his share of guidebooks to early computers. This thing came out in, in 1990, I think. So you know, before the internet, as the general public knew it. But he wasn't the general public then. He knew what was coming, and he knew how to explain it. And this book tries to explain sequential thinking. It tries to explain what we would now call an algorithm. It tries to explain these things, and it tries to do them in a whole bunch of different ways. Uh, the back cover copy says, it's a cleverly illustrated and eminently comprehensible story. Uh, and along the way, you'll discover you've gained a real context for understanding today's world of PCs, digital media, and the internet. No matter what your level of technical savvy, code will charm you and perhaps even awaken the technophile within. 
that's what sold me. Don't need much selling for a dollar, but that's what did it, is that I, books like that, I am endlessly interested in reading these kinds of books, endlessly. My whole life is technology. I couldn't do my job without it, couldn't enjoy myself without it, couldn't talk to you without it. Uh, I know what some of you are thinking, and I agree. I have said many times on this channel that I'm pretty rough with my books. I don't don't keep them in the pristine condition that so many of the rest of you do. But even I was absolutely shocked that the previous owner of this book wrote on the cover in pen. That is just beyond the pale, <laughs> beyond the pale. So in case you're wondering, we have that at least in common. I would also have said, what were you thinking? There's no way to get that off. Uh, I can clean the rest of this, but I can't I can't do anything with that. I can put a sticker over it, but that's all. Uh, so code. We'll find out all about code. It'll be fun to read because I might it I might have a little bit of parody with the author, right? He's a huge expert. But this is a book written before all the stuff that we know about code today. So he today if he's still alive knows a lot more on this subject than he knew when he wrote this book and by extension i know some stuff that he didn't know when he wrote this book maybe that will give me enough footing what you doing baby what you doing starting to get antsy mm, i've been talking too long <laughs> you starting to get antsy aren't you yeah. <laughs> oh, we met a new puppy in the neighborhood just yesterday, Artemis, a little French bulldog, three months old, something like that, jumping up on her leash, wagging her little paws in the air, snorting and spitting phlegm everywhere because she wanted nothing more than to play with Frida. And I had to tell the poor dog, Frida doesn't play. And even when she was your age, she didn't play. She doesn't play. She doesn't understand what play is. Uh, it's unruly. And you're really bouncing around too much. So I, 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 I try not to talk to puppies when they're that young because that's me getting in between them and their owner. I try not to do that. But I was down on the ground by this point. I was right at Artemis's level and I told her, me, not her. Just ignore her. Just come straight to me. You can, you can slosh all over my face if you want. Uh, anyway, code. Uh, so we're gonna we'll move from that, which is a subject about which I know very little. It is an alien ground to me. We'll move from that to a subject that uh, about which I know a lot. <laughs> and this is a book I've had many times before. I always get rid of it. I always give it to somebody. Uh, so I found another copy in hardcover. I grabbed it. Who knows how long I'll hold on to it? I hope so. This is by Jeremy Paxman, and this is on royalty, uh, which is about mainly the House of Windsor, but all sorts of uh, connected royal families as well. And it's it's. Paxman is quotable on every page. Just wonderful, the thinking that he's done here. It's all of his lifetime favorite quips about royalty, but it's also lots of great insights. I, I, as far as a book on modern on the concepts of modern royalty, and especially on the House of Windsor, I love it. Absolutely love it. And I've, I had, I'm sure that it's been in library tours of mine. I've had it recently. But every time, I, every time somebody sees it on the shelf when they come over, they say, oh, this looks really good. I just give it to them. Uh, you can bet. If I have crowds of people over here ever again, post-COVID, uh, it's not gonna happen. <laughs> no way. Isn't it enough that I'm paying for the wine, that I'm paying for the food? Isn't that enough? Did you have to prowl around my shelves picking books that you want? <sighs> I say that, but you know exactly what's gonna happen if that ever happens again. I know, I know. But anyway, uh, this next one is uh, a memoir uh, by a mystery author. This this person was part of a mystery duo who wrote endless, mur I don't know, 100 murder mystery novels. 200 murder mystery I don't know how many endless series endless novels there was never a time never even a half a year when there wasn't a book being worked on being proved being run through the, the presses or whatever uh, but this is not fiction this is this is a, a, a memoir that I have only seen I have never actually read it the author is Richard Lockridge and the, most of the series most of the murder mystery series that he wrote he wrote with his first wife uh, and this is a memoir about his time getting to know the woman who would eventually become his second wife. And it's called One Lady, Two Cats. Uh, and I, the parts of this that I have read, I've never owned it. I've never read the whole thing. Parts that I've read ha, were, have been wonderful. Very cat-centric, but wonderful. You cat people out there are probably going to want a copy of this book. Uh, let me see if I can get you an example of what I'm talking about here. Uh, I got out of bed much more abruptly than is my custom. But I was not abrupt enough, or perhaps I was not quiet enough. 
Sherry heard my movement and Sherry began to talk about it, about the closed door, the hunger of cats, the unacceptable sluggishness of humans. Needless to say, Sherry is one of the cats. Uh, there is no adequate way of describing Sherry's voice when she decides to speak up. She is Siamese, and Siamese cats do not speak as other cats. The pitch is very different, and Sherry, as an individual, has a voice of sometimes almost unbearable penetration. She produces tones which must, I think, surprise even her. Now and then, in the middle of a yowl, she seems to hear herself and stops abruptly in what I take to be astonishment. Or perhaps it's pride. <laughs> I think I'm going to really enjoy this. Uh, and it, it's So many of the books that I'm finding in the Brattle have these, uh, nowadays, have these plastic library covers on them. That's just wonderful. That, 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 they're going to live, for, live forever. And I bet these things help with uh, sunlight exposure, too. Uh, to prevent fading. This next book has one of those. I've had this many, many, many times. I always get rid of it or give it away. Found it again. I really like it. Uh, so now I found it in one of these library dust jackets. I'm going to hope to hold on to it. This is the occasional prose, the kind of stuff that I write, by the, the poet Robert Lowell. Uh, he of the Boston Brahmin Lowells. He of the Charles, uh, the James Char uh, Russell Lowell, uh, the, uh, all of the Lowell judges and astronomers and authors and whatnot. And this is the poet. I've never really warmed up to his poetry, but I, he's on the list. I always keep a sort of a rotating list of authors that I'm going to revisit, that I intend to, re, to do a systematic revisit of. Some of those revisits don't yield much. Others do. So I've kept the, pro, the habit up for many decades. And he's on the list to revisit his poetry. Uh, I kept close contact, uh, kept close uh, awareness of the critical response to uh, the Dolphin Letters, a volume that came out a couple of years ago, I think, of his his correspondence with Elizabeth Hardwick and all of their friends. Uh, I, the same kind of, it was reviewed in a million places. That volume was reviewed in a million places. And uh, years before that, there was a volume of his letters with Elizabeth Bishop. That also was reviewed in a million places. Uh, so I'm really familiar with his letters. I know, I think I know a lot about the man from the correspondence. And I, of course, have read uh, major biographies in Hamilton's and also Setting the River on Fire which is a, a newer Robert Lowell biography that was oh, terrific terrific and uh, this is his his deadline prose this is where somebody would go to him and say you know we have a, we need a new preface for Tolstoy or something like that would you would you you know write would you write something up even I think I think there are even a couple of straight out book reviews here uh, maybe even more than a couple yeah, Auden at 60, uh, Randall Jarrell, Dylan Thomas, John Berryman, Sylvia Plath, uh, The Iliad, Hawthorne, Gettysburg Address. Uh, yeah, I think there are. I think there are some uh, some reviews in here as well, and then plenty of others, plenty of other stuff. This volume, uh, if I remember correctly, includes the letters that he wrote, uh, one to... Uh, President Truman, I think it was. He wrote a famous letter to President Johnson objecting to the, the Vietnam War. He also wrote a letter saying that he didn't want to go to war himself in World War II. Oh, that was Roosevelt. President Roosevelt wrote a letter saying, I, I, I got your invitation to go to war, uh, the draft, in other words, but I don't want to do it. Uh, he spent time in prison for, for objecting to the war. Uh, but this is not going to be any of that. This is not anything... I don't think I have any biographies. I don't think I've kept even Hamilton's biography. I don't think I have any of them. Uh, but this is the way that I like to, to to experience authors anyway, is through my kind of prose for the my overwhelming, overwhelmed, hugely overcrowded section on books about books, books of collected writings and whatnot. This is the way I like to approach authors anyway, uh, because this is the ground on which I understand them most intimately. They're doing the exact same thing on a, on a much higher level that I do. Uh, uh, then these next three books are, uh, we are, we are approaching the end, don't worry. Uh, the Brattle recently, uh, they're out buying all the time, right? They've got a sale, their, their van is out buying all the time. And they, so they encounter collections. They buy whole collections at a time. And that can mean that you will see, both in the sale lot and in the store itself, a huge advent of some kind of thing, whether it's hundreds and hundreds of murder mysteries, uh, somebody that gets rid of a lot of history, some of a lot of contemporary fiction signed editions or whatnot. And the latest one of those, the latest huge inundation at the Brattle is books on Ireland. Just, just 
hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books on Ireland, every possible description of books on uh, fam biographies of famous Irish people, biographies of non-famous Irish people, naturally collections of short stories, the quintessential Irish art form, histories of Irish literature, histories of the Easter Rebellion and whatnot, uh, just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books. And I, I've i been looking through them. I, it's a little bit daunting. I, I don't want to get them all. I don't want to suddenly swamp my own collection with Irish books. So I've been trying to pick and choose the ones that I know I want and that I know I will revisit. I don't know how likely that is, but I got three today. Only three. I saw all of them. I ran my eye over every single one, and I picked out three. The first one is uh, very close to the, the Robert Lowell volume. It also will go in that, that Books About Books collection. This is a collection of pieces by the great Hugh Kenner uh, of Irish writers. Uh, it's called the, A Colder Eye, The Modern Irish Writers. And there you have the big three, but then you've got lots of others as well. And he writes about all of them with an abandon of malice. This is a tremendously deconstructing book, just devastating. He knew a lot of these people, and he knows a lot about what they're up to, and it, there is nothing phoned in here. Uh, you're going to get a lot of phoned in stuff in the Robert Lowell volume, but nothing here, and there's nothing here like you're going to read anywhere else. A lot of the authors were dead when he wrote about them, but they, it, that must have the ones who were alive, it must have been the stalking nightmare of their entire life that Hugh Kenner was going to write a 30-page piece about that, because some of these things just leave no red corpuscles left behind. <laughs> I loved reading this. I've always loved it. And this is a... Is this some sort of book club edition? I don't even know. Uh, this is a trade paperback. I would ordinarily have maybe held out for a hardcover, because I don't have a copy of this, and I, I know I'm going to be re-annotating it. Uh, but I grabbed the, the trade paperback. It was dirt cheap, and I'll, I'll reinforce it and try and be gentle to it. And this next thing came in one of those Mylar library protective covers and it says Harvard but I can't help but think that this is a Harvard press printing from another country because I've had this book before and I don't remember it being this big although I wanted it to be I love it I wanted it to be bigger than it was this is by uh, Declan Kibbard and this is Inventing Ireland a big study but this is a bigger hardcover than I've ever had of it a big study of his of Irish literature so all of these figures are in here but also lots of movements and lots and lots of the social and political stuff going on that was moving those movements or curtailing them. A literary history of the absolute first water. I loved it. Naturally, when I was getting these books, I was thinking of Jason Harrigan. At the Brattle, I often think of Jason Harrigan and Mark Richardson. And I think about, you know, what are they going to want? What, what would they think about this? Is this a good thing for me to get? That sort of thing. Uh, and I was wondering, I got three Irish books today, and of course I was wondering what the Pope of Booktube makes of all of them. I'm pretty sure he's going to give uh, at least this a thumbs up. Uh, but I, the only big Irish tome that I know I love, that I passed on today, was Foster's Modern Irish History, 1600 to 19 to 2020 or something like 2000. I'm sure you've seen, a lot of you have seen the trade paperback of Foster's book, which is black on the spine. It's a big, fat thing, uh, a history of modern Ireland. And uh, I've had it many, many times. I don't think I have it now. I, and I left a couple of copies of that behind. Uh, but I didn't leave this behind. This, this, my interests have moved, have shifted a little towards reading more about literature than about history, even the history of literature. So I grabbed this. And then the third Irish book I got, I've had this before, and I remember really liking it, uh, but I didn't hold on to it. And so I, now I have it again. This is edited by Sean Dunn, and it is the Ireland Anthology. And the thing I remember really liking about this is how jam-packed it is. It's a smaller book than The Kibbard, but it's, it's got a million different samples in it. Let me show you the uh, oh, wow. Books, bookmark from Waterstones Booksellers. Wow. They used to have a big, beautiful store on Exeter Street in Boston. Just a beautiful thing. Uh, three stories, an old, an old building. The, it just The architecture just won out, just won you over when you were in there. And uh, it burned. That that Waterstones burned, and and the, the flames jumping out of the windows, all the stock destroyed. The building was saved, uh, and, but Waterstones left, and they 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 promised everybody that they would be back in that location. They never came back to that location. They still had a couple of others, uh, but I want to show you the uh, the table of contents here because it goes on and on and on. Look at how much stuff. Uh, this this editor jams into this book. 
just over it. He's clearly going, right? This is an anthologist decision. Some of them don't make that decision. Some of them do. He's clearly going for as much different material as he can get in here. And I often love that approach in an anthologist because often it introduces me to things uh, that I wouldn't otherwise meet and that I wouldn't meet in an author, in an anthology editor who's trying to give you long pieces of fewer things. Uh, so that, those were that was my, my three Ireland books today. Uh, but I also got a big fat biography. You can't go to the Brattle without getting a big fat biography. This biography is big and fat because of supposition. You cannot write a biography this size based on primary documents. But we'll be getting to that because this is about Shakespeare and we're about to turn the corner into Shake Timber. August booktube event in which myself and other booktubers discuss all things Shakespeare all month long. So I couldn't resist. I've had this before, but this is in perfect condition with one of those library dust jackets. This is Peter Aykroyd's book on Shakespeare, which he very presumptuously calls the biography. Look at the size of this thing. We don't know enough about Shakespeare to warrant a book this size. And I read this book. I've read it a couple of times. I used to have a paperback that I read until it literally fell apart. And Aykroyd is forced to do here what all Shakespeare biographers are forced to do. He's forced on every page to say, we can presume, we can assume, it's most likely. The best guess is, because we don't have the documents. He has to do that. But uh, naturally, I'm curious about this. In the, way, in, the, in the shadow of the impending Shaketober, I'm curious again about all things Shakespeare. Uh, and then the last thing we'll do for this Brattle, this Brattle Hall, to, get, to, to stock me up before the heat wave, is a big oversized thing. I try to control myself with oversized books. The Brattle always has a, the sale lot always has hundreds of them. And they get very tempting. But oversized books for me are kind of white elephants yeah you know they're they're very attractive and on paper and when i look at them but you don't i don't actually use them they're too big to be comfortably pulled off the shelf and just perused on my belly they're too big to be they're too unwieldy usually i make an exception for that when it comes to oversized collections of new yorker cartoons so maybe that's not legitimate one way or another when i see one that's totally charming i tend to grab it and if i don't keep it i give it away I have the perfect recipient for this if I don't keep it, but this is the Saturday Evening Post book of Ships in the Sea. Slightly oversized, there's a Norman Rockwell painting on the cover there. Uh, and I believe this back, no, this back is, is uh, John Clymer. This is not Norman Rockwell, but there you have a, a ship in winter. There's the track of the dog just watching there. Uh, and this is l l pieces of prose that have, that have come and gone in the Saturday Evening Post back when it was at, in its heyday, back when it was selling a million copies a week. Uh, and th there's pieces of prose, favorite articles from the Saturday Evening Post, plus tons and tons of illustrations from all of their artists, J.C. Leyendecker, Norman Rockwell, all of the lesser known names whose work you would love from the old Saturday Evening Post. What, how wonder the Saturday Evening Post still exists. You can still subscribe to it, I think, but it's a shadow of its former self, and, and that's a shame. I, what a, how wonderful it would be if it was still fingered directly on the, uh, the, the cultural and fun pulse of the American reading public. The, post, the Saturday Evening Post was, was uh, unseated by the same thing that unseated so many of periodicals like it, Life and whatnot, in that the, American, the general American public gradually stopped reading. There's not much you can do if that's the case. If you're heavily subsidized, like Smithsonian Magazine, yes, but... Otherwise, if you're counting on subscription sales or newsstand sales, you won't have them anymore. But this is going to be delightful. Uh, th this was made to be delightful. This is not a definitive history of ships and sailing. Instead, it's a wonderful look at how ships and sailing have reflected in the post over the, over the decades. That's going to be great. This will be an oversized book. I'll spend time with it today. Uh, so there you go. That was a preheat wave brattle trip. Uh, we have the Saturday Evening Post book of Ships and the Sea. We have uh, Shakespeare, The Biography by Peter Ackroyd. We have a trilogy of Irish books, the Irish and the Ireland Anthology, A Colder Eye by the great Hugh Kenner, and uh, Inventing Ireland. Uh, so heavy on the literary, but that's all right. There are plenty of other books there if I want more. Then The Collected Prose of Robert Lowell, uh, uh, One Lady, Two Cats by the author of the Mr. and Mrs. North Mysteries, On Royalty by Jeremy Paxman, uh, Code by one of the pioneers of what we consider modern code. Uh, oh no, this is going to fall. <laughs> then we'll do the paperbacks. Uh, the, War of, for the, end of the, the War of the End of the World, 
by Mario Vargasiosa. Cannot recommend that author strongly enough. One of the few instances where Dude Bro readers and I agree. Uh, the Chantry Guild by Gordon Dixon in a mass market. Time Storm by Gordon Dixon in a mass market. Uh, the King of Elfland's Daughter by Lord Dunsany uh, to get back to Ireland. Uh, and uh, Night of the River by Robert Block. So there you go. A nice big antic Brattle book bookstall, uh, bookstore hall. Uh, that's going to have to tide you over. It's going to have to tide me over too, because I don't think I'm going back to the Brattle when it's when it's egg boilingly hot in Boston. I don't think I'm. I mean, the Brattle's open. They'll be op they, they have a store. They'll 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 even be hardy sadomasochists who will want to go out to the sale lot in 95 degree weather. But not me. <laughs> no, not me. Not anymore. Uh, especially not if it means that I'll be worried about an overheated dog back here. So I probably won't go back to the Brattle for another week. So you're going to have to steal yourself. <laughs> well, maybe I'll I'll increase I'll in order to fill the void I will increase the library tour of doom so that we're still talking about boring old books. Wouldn't want to stop doing that. But in the meantime, I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, Book Two.